The human resource management legal environment has become significantly more complex in the last 30 years. There has been a significant number of laws enacted just in the past 10 years that affect how organizations must do business. In addition, we have grown to believe that we value diversity in the workforce much more than in the 1960s and 1970s. In this course, we'll explore some of the laws that HR managers have to work with on a daily basis, and we'll also look in some more depth at diversity and why it's valuable in any organization. Discrimination is the act of making distinctions or choosing one thing over another. In HR, it's making distinctions among people. So you can quickly see that we discriminate every day. If managers don't discriminate, they're not doing their jobs. However, we want to avoid illegal discrimination based on a person's membership in a protected class. We'll discuss protected classes shortly. And we want to avoid unfair treatment of any of our employees at all times. Illegal discrimination is making distinctions that harm people and that are based on those people's membership in a protected class. Before we start talking about equal employment opportunity and all the forms of illegal discrimination in the workplace, let's take the opportunity to introduce you to the OUCH test or O-U-C-H test. The OUCH test is a rule of thumb used whenever you're contemplating any employment action to maintain fairness and equity for all of your employees or applicants. You should use this test whenever you're contemplating any action that involves your employees. OUCH is an acronym that stands for Objective, Uniform in Application, Consistent in Effect, and has Job Relatedness. Is the action objective or is it subjective? Something that's objective is based on fact, cognitive knowledge, or quantifiable evidence, not on personal feelings or prejudices. Is the action being uniformly applied? In other words, if you had any action in an employment situation, are you applying that same action in all the cases of the same type? Consistent in effect. Does the action take a significantly different effect on one or more protected groups than it has on the majority group? The four-fifths rule is a test used by various federal courts, the Department of Labor, and the EEOC to determine whether disparate impact exists in an employment test. If we're out of compliance with the four-fifths rule, we automatically have not necessarily broken the law. We do have to investigate why we're outside the four-fifths parameter, though. By the way, we can also look at the sixth-fifths to determine the possibility of reverse discrimination. It's the same concept with slightly different numbers. Finally, is the action directly related to the primary aspects of the job in question? The word primary will become very important later as we discuss the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, and we call these factors essential functions. Remember that the OUCH test is a rule of thumb that does not work perfectly. It's not a legal test by itself. The Equal Pay Act requires that women who do the same job as men in the same organization must receive the same pay. It defines equal in terms of equal skill, effort, and responsibility, and performed under similar working conditions. While the EPA was designed to equalize pay between men and women, the act was never fully successful. But the next law we'll discuss added serious consequences to such unequal treatment. That's the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. It changed the way that virtually every organization in the country did business, and it even helped change employers' attitudes about discrimination. Even in cases where the law does not directly apply to an organization, it has been used to evaluate internal policies to attempt to ensure fairness and equity for all workers. The law makes it illegal for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or to otherwise discriminate against any individual. It's also illegal to limit, segregate, or classify employees or applicants for employment in any way which would deprive or trend to deprive any individual from employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect his status as an employee because of such an individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. 
This act applies to organizations with 15 or more employees who are working 20 or more weeks a year and who are involved in interstate commerce. Why does the organization have to be involved in interstate commerce? Mainly because of the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which deals with state rights. The federal government can't make any laws that apply wholly within the borders of a single state. The law also generally applies to state and local governments, educational institutions, public or private, all employment agencies, and all labor associations of any type. Some of the important concepts introduced by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 include disparate treatment, disparate, also called adverse impact, a bona fide occupational qualification known as a BFOQ, business necessity, and job relatedness. In any management position within any organization today, you need a basic understanding of the major employment laws that you currently face. Court rulings have helped to further define the three types, which we have come to call disparate treatment, disparate impact, and pattern or practice. Disparate treatment and impact are also called adverse treatment or impact. In addition, there are two additional types of discrimination, religious discrimination and sexual harassment. Disparate treatment exists when individuals in similar situations are intentionally treated differently, and the different treatment is based on an individual's membership in a protected class. Disparate treatment is generally illegal unless the employer can show that there was a bona fide occupational qualification. Disparate impact occurs when an officially neutral employment practice disproportionately excludes the members of a protected group. It is generally considered to be unintentional, but intent is irrelevant. As an example, some characteristics like height and strength are not distributed equally across race and gender groups, and in some jobs, these characteristics may be related to successful performance of the job. The important question is whether the characteristic is related to the successful performance of the job, meaning whether it has job relatedness. Disparate impact is generally judged by using the four-fifths rule. Both the Department of Labor, through their Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, and the EEOC have expressed a preference for using the four-fifths rule to determine disparate impact. The four-fifths rule requires that if we fall outside of its boundaries, we must investigate to ensure that we haven't used an illegal protected class characteristic to bias an employment outcome. Pattern or practice discrimination occurs when a person or group engages in a sequence of actions over a significant period of time that's intended to deny rights provided by Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to a member of a protected class. It must be proven that the employer intended to discriminate against a particular class of individuals and did so over a period of time. We can defend ourselves by showing either that there was a need for a particular characteristic or qualification for a specific job or that there was a requirement that the business do certain things in order to remain viable and profitable so that we don't harm all of our employees by failing and shutting down. Let's review these defenses now. The first defense is a bona fide occupational qualification known as a BFOQ, a qualification that is absolutely required in order for an individual to be able to successfully do a particular job. The qualification cannot just be a desirable quality for the job applicant, it must be mandatory. A BFOQ would be a legitimate defense against a charge of disparate treatment. Business necessity exists when a particular practice is necessary for the safe and efficient operation of the business and when there's a specific business purpose for applying a particular standard that may, in fact, be discriminatory. A business necessity defense is applied by an employer in order to show that a particular practice was necessary for the safe and efficient operation of the business and that there's a specific business purpose. Business necessity defenses must be combined with a test for job relatedness. Job relatedness exists when a test for employment is a legitimate measure of an individual's ability to do the essential functions of a job. 
For job relatedness to act as a defense against a charge of discrimination, the organization's action first has to be a business necessity, and then the employer must be able to show that the test for the employment action was a legitimate measure. The best way to defend against illegal discrimination charges is to avoid actions that could bring such charges about. The ADEA prohibits discrimination against employees aged 40 or older. In this case, it applies to an organization of 20 or more workers instead of 15. The wording of this act exactly mirrors Title VII with the exception of the 20 worker minimum. This mirroring of the 1964 Civil Rights Act is true of nearly all of the protected class discrimination laws that came about after 1964. Why did Congress pass the ADEA? It was passed in response to a business practice that started to become significant as an issue in the 1960s. Companies began to lay off older workers who tended to have higher salaries and then hire younger workers who would usually work for significant less money. Congress became aware of these actions and decided that it was unfair form of discrimination against people who had spent many years of their lives working for the same companies. The law that resulted was the ADEA. Age discrimination complaints make up one-fifth to one-quarter of all actions filed with the EEOC, and these cases can be very costly. However, it applies only to federal contractors. Why was the law enacted? It was primarily due to the fact that after the war with Vietnam, military veterans came home to a public that was largely opposed to our participation in the war. As a result, some employers would discriminate against Vietnam-era veterans for taking part in a war that they personally had been opposed to. Congress decided that that was not acceptable for employers to single out veterans who had done only what the country had required of them, so they passed the Vivra to prohibit such behaviors. The law requires that employers with federal contracts or subcontracts of $100,000 or more provide equal employment opportunity and affirmative action for Vietnam-era veterans, special disabled veterans, and veterans who served on active duty during a war or in a campaign or expedition for which a campaign badge has been authorized. It prohibits discrimination against women affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions as unlawful sex discrimination under Title VII, and requires that they be treated as all other employees for employment-related purposes, including benefits. Why was the PDA passed? As health insurance costs started to rise in the 1970s, companies started to look for ways to lower those costs. One way they found was to exclude pregnancy from their health insurance policies. By the mid-1970s, only a minority of employers covered pregnancy and related illnesses in their health policies, even though women made up more than 45% of the workforce. Finally, in 1976, a Supreme Court decision ruled that denying benefits for pregnancy-related disability was not discrimination based on sex. This ruling outraged many women's advocacy organizations and in turn put pressure on Congress, which passed the PDA in 1978. Again, this law is mandatory for companies with 15 or more employees, including employment agencies, labor organizations, and state and local governments. We would like to think that companies are beyond this type of discrimination today. However, there continues to be many examples of such discrimination.
One of the major changes in the amendment was the addition of compensatory and punitive damages in cases of intentional discrimination under Title VII and under the ADA when intentional or reckless discrimination is proven. Compensatory damages are monetary damages awarded by the court to compensate the injured person for losses. Such losses can include the potential future monetary losses like loss of earning capacity, emotional pain, suffering, and loss of enjoyment of life. Punitive damages are monetary damages awarded by the court that are designed to punish the injuring party that has intentionally inflicted harm on others. They're meant to discourage employers from intentionally discriminating, and they do this by providing for payments to the plaintiff beyond the actual damages suffered. Recognizing that one or a few discrimination cases could put an organization out of business, adversely affecting many innocent employees, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 provides for a sliding scale of upper limits or caps on the combined amount of compensatory and punitive damages based on the number of employees employed by the employer. Another major area in which the 1991 Act changed the original Civil Rights Act is in the application of quotas for protected group members. Many companies after the 1964 Civil Rights Act was introduced created or used quotas for hiring and promotion. The quotas were made explicitly illegal by the 1991 Act. In addition, the Act prohibits discriminatory use of test scores which is commonly called race norming. Race norming exists when different groups of people have different scores designated as passing grades on a test for employment. One group may have higher requirements for passing grades, while another is allowed to pass at a lower level. The 1991 Act basically equated this with quotas and as such made it illegal. Unlike other EEO laws, there is no minimum number of employees required for coverage by USERA. All employers must comply with the law. Per the U.S. Department of Labor's website, USERA is intended to minimize the disadvantages to an individual that occur when that person needs to be absent from his or her civilian employment to serve this country's uniformed services. USERA makes major improvements in protecting service member rights and benefits by clarifying the law and improving enforcement mechanisms. USERA covers virtually every individual in the country who serves or has served in the uniformed services, and it applies to all employers in the public and private sectors, including federal employers. Under USERA, the employee returning from military service is not only entitled to the job that they had held when they left, but they're entitled to any escalation attained. It made two significant changes to USERA. USERA extended the requirement for employers to maintain health coverage for employees who were serving on active duty in the military. Originally, this period was 18 months, but VEBA changed it to two years. USERA requires employers to post a notice of benefits, duties, and rights in a place where it would be visible to all employees who might be affected. Title II of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 prohibits the use of genetic information in employment, prohibits the intentional acquisition of genetic information about applicants and employees, and imposes strict confidentiality requirements. GINA was created basically because recent advances in genetic testing were taking place. We're now able to identify some genetic information that relates to predisposition to contract certain diseases or disorders such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. In order to prevent increases in medical premiums, some companies were starting to use these tests as a decision-making tool in hiring of employees, and some insurance companies were using such tests to determine healthcare coverage. There's some question about pre-existing conditions. If you have a genetic marker for a disease, does that mean that it's a pre-existing condition and therefore not covered by some insurance policies? Because companies were starting to use these tests to make employment and healthcare decisions, Congress decided to address their use. The result was GINA. The law prohibits discrimination based on genetic information and restricts acquisition and disclosure of such information. 
Congress enacted this law so that the general public would not fear adverse employment-related or health care coverage consequences for having a genetic test or participating in research studies that examine genetic information. In practical terms, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act extends the period of time in which employees are allowed to file a lawsuit for compensation, pay, discrimination. The 1964 Civil Rights Act only allowed 180 days from the time of the discriminatory action for an individual employee to file a lawsuit. The Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act allows an individual to file a lawsuit within 180 days after any application of that discriminatory compensation decision, including every time the individual gets paid, as long as the discrimination is continuing, which would usually be for the entire period of their employment. One of the most significant aspects of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act is that it amends to the time allowed to file a discrimination complaint and could also be determined by the courts to apply other anti-discrimination laws like the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which borrow Title VII limitation periods. In general, these laws are designed for two purposes. To require verification of the legal right to work within the United States and to prevent potential discrimination against immigrant workers who are legally allowed to work in the country. The two major laws in this area are the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 as amended and the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. While immigration law is extremely complex, for our purposes, in an introductory to HR type course, we'll discuss only the basic employment provisions of these two laws. Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 known as the INA. The INA is designed to take a variety of different immigration laws and combine them into a single act. Before INA, a number of federal laws governed immigration, but they were not consistent and were not organized in one location under one authority. The INA allows companies in the United States to employ immigrant workers in certain specialty occupations through the use of an H-1 visa. For example, foreign workers, such as engineers, teachers, computer programs, medical doctors, and physical therapists may be employed under the H-1B program. However, specific requirements apply to such employment, and there are annual limits on the number of workers who can apply for work visas in these specialty occupations. Because Congress foresaw the potential for companies to discriminate against all alien workers to avoid any accusation of hiring undocumented workers, INA also has a non-discrimination requirement when dealing with alien workers who have the right to work in the United States. The Immigration Reform and Control Act provides that employees may hire only individuals who are authorized to legally work in the United States. The Immigration Reform and Control Act has a provision that prohibits employers from knowingly hiring undocumented workers, and it requires employers to verify each employee's eligibility for employment. The employer is required to verify the identity and employment eligibility of anyone it hires through the use of a form called the Employment Eligibility Verification Form, otherwise known as Form I-9. However, the Act also provides employers comply with in good faith requirements of the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which is what's called an affirmative defense to inadvertently hiring unauthorized aliens. An affirmative defense means basically that if we made a legitimate and complete effort to verify a person's legal status, and it turns out that the person provided false documents or that we were tricked or lied to in some other way, we won't be held liable for any potential fines that would have otherwise been assessed for hiring undocumented workers. The EEOC was created by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as an enforcement arm of the Act. It is a federal agency that has significant power over employers in the process of investigating complaints of illegal discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. The EEOC is the federal agency primarily charged with the enforcement of the federal equal employment opportunity laws. The EEOC has three significant responsibilities. First, investigating and resolving discrimination complaints either through conciliation or litigation. 
second, gathering and compiling statistical information on such complaints, and third, running education and outreach programs on what constitutes illegal discrimination. Additionally, every company with more than 100 employees or with more than 50 employees and with federal contracts totaling $50,000 must file an EEO-1 report with the EEOC each year. The EEO-1 identifies the company's EEO compliance data based on protected classifications within federal law. In addition, the EEO-1 has started including requirements for the reporting of compensation data from companies with more than 100 employees. Individuals must typically file a complaint within 180 days of an incident or the last occurrence of the incident if it's ongoing. If the EEOC cannot come to an agreement with the organization, there are two options. First, the agency may aid the alleged victim in bringing suit in federal court. Or second, it can issue a right to sue letter to the victim. If the EEOC does not believe the complaint to be valid or fails to complete the investigation, the complainant still may sue in federal court or on their own. Employees have the right to bring discrimination complaints against their employer by filing a complaint with the EEOC. The employer has the right to defend the organization using certain defenses, including a bona fide occupational qualification or BFOQ defense, business necessity, and job relatedness. In addition to providing defenses against discrimination claims, the 1964 Civil Rights Act identifies a situation in which organizations can be held liable for harming the employee because of retaliation. An adverse employment action is any action such as firing, demotion, schedule reduction, or changes that would harm the individual employee. Retaliation is a form of harassment based on an individual filing a discrimination claim. The organization can also be accused of constructive discharge due to discriminatory actions on the job. Constructive discharge exists when an employee is put under such extreme pressure by management that continued employment becomes intolerable and, as a result, the employee quits or resigns from the organization. In a Supreme Court decision in 2004, the court noted that the U.S. Court of Appeals had identified constructive discharge as the following. First, suffering harassment or discrimination so intolerable that a reasonable person would have felt compelled to resign. Second, the employee's reaction to the workplace situation was reasonable given the circumstances. Every employer or manager needs to understand this concept. There are significantly different concepts, but many employees and employers and even some educators tend to use these terms interchangeably. EEO is the term that deals with a series of laws and regulations put in place by the federal and state government level over the last 45 years. As such, EEO is very specific and narrowly defined within federal and state laws. Affirmative action, except in a few circumstances, does not have the effect of law. Finally, diversity is not law, nor necessarily even policy, within organizations. Diversity is a very broad set of concepts that deal with the differences among people within organizations. However, there are no specific laws that create requirements for diversity within organizations. Beyond the EEO laws that specifically identify protected class members and require that organizations deal with those protected class members in an equal way when compared to all other members of the organization. While this certainly creates some greater diversity in organizations, the concept of diversity goes much further than just EEO. When we've already discussed many of the major equal employment opportunity laws, now you can take a look at affirmative action and the concept of diversity in more detail as a human resource or people manager. Affirmative action is a series of policies, programs, and initiatives that have been instituted by various entities within both government and private sector to design and prefer hiring individuals from protected groups in certain circumstances in an attempt to mitigate past discrimination. However, affirmative action policies and programs do not generally have the same effect as EEO laws. There are actually only two specific cases in which affirmative action can be mandated or required within an organization. In all other cases, creation of an affirmative action program is strictly voluntary. 
If a company is a contractor to the federal government and receives more than $10,000 per year, they're required by presidential order, Executive Order 11246, to maintain an affirmative action program. If an organization is presented with a federal court order to create an affirmative action program to correct past discriminatory practices, it must comply. This is usually done only when there's an egregious history of past discrimination practices within an organization. There have been a number of recent affirmative action rulings in federal courts that have upheld limits to affirmative action. For example, the Supreme Court ordered a lower court to reconsider a race-conscious admissions plan for Texas State Universities, and it also upheld a voter-backed affirmative action ban in Michigan's universities. Additionally, other states are looking at possible or partial or full bans of affirmative action. This will be an area to watch in human resource management over the next several years. Diversity is simply the existence of differences. In human resource management, it deals with different types of people in an organization. This brings up a number of questions. Why do we want to have diversity in organizations? What can we do about any disadvantages? So let's discuss diversity as it provides both opportunities and challenges to human resource management. Is diversity really all that important? The answer is yes. There's currently a shortage of skilled workers, and there will be for the foreseeable future. So to exclude a qualified person because that individual is different in some way is counterproductive to business success. Discrimination based on protected characteristics is also against the law. According to the United Nations, in late 2011, the world population hit 7 billion people. However, the world Caucasian population is shrinking as more whites die each year than are born. It takes about 2.1 children per women, the fertility rate, to replace the current generation. But the estimated 2016 fertility rate in the European Union was 1.61, and in the United States was 1.87, while worldwide it's 2.42. As of 2012, white births were no longer the majority in the United States. White women are having fewer children than minorities, while the growth of mixed marriages has led to more multicultural births. It should be clear that increasing cultural diversity in the workforce poses one of the most challenging human resource and organizational issues of our time. Why do we need diversity? Diversity is important and needed because as the white population continues to shrink and the minority populations grow, interacting with a wide array of customers and suppliers increases sales, revenues, and profits. In other words, embracing diversity creates business opportunities. Organizations today have begun to value the diversity of their workforces simply due to the fact that as they become more diverse, they can serve a larger and more diverse customer base. Diverse employees allow us to see the diversity around us, in our customers, other stakeholders, and much better than if our work groups were homogeneous. As a result, we're better able to provide products and services that will appeal to the larger and more diverse groups that we come into contact with during the course of during business. What are the advantages of a diverse workforce? The primary advantage of a diverse workforce comes from the ability to stimulate and provide more creative and innovative solutions to organizational problems. How does a more diverse workforce add to the creativity and innovation of an organization? Creativity is a basic ability to think in unique and different ways and apply those thought processes to existing problems. And innovation is the act of creating useful processes or products based on creative thought processes. Basically, if we look at a problem from different perspectives, we find out that there are more facets to the problem than originally we realized. Have you ever been in a situation where you just couldn't find something? You asked someone else to help you search for it and they found it almost immediately? A diversified group looking at a problem will look at the problem from different directions and in different ways, and therefore it will discover more of the aspects of the problem than a single person would or would a homogeneous group. But why is creativity necessary in business today? Organizations in today's fast-moving industries have to be able to innovate and change to adapt to their external environment, their competitors, their customers, and changes in technology. If an organization is unable to rapidly innovate, it will most certainly die in today's business world. 
Also, creativity is a rare commodity in organizations. Why is it hard to be so creative? Most of us have learned not to be creative. We've been told over and over as we've grown up that we should do things the way everyone else does them. In other words, we've been trained not to be innovative. Over time, this is an effect of causing most of us to give up on being very creative and just go along with the way the majority of people are doing something. We lose the ability to think differently. This ability, called divergent thinking, is necessary in order to come up with creative solutions to a problem. Divergent thinking is the ability to find many possible solutions to a particular problem, including unique, untested solutions. By introducing diversity into our workforce, we assist the process of divergent thinking. Different people think differently because they have different backgrounds and have solved problems differently in the past. There are several things that can cause diversity to break down the organization instead of allowing it to become better and more creative. Conflict is simply the act of being opposed to another. Conflict occurs in all interactions between individuals, and there are many reasons for conflict. Is conflict bad? Not necessarily. Conflict can basically be broken down into functional conflict and dysfunctional conflict. Functional conflict is how organizations go through the process of creating new things. The opposition itself drives organizations to change. If we don't have conflicts, the organization never changes. However, dysfunctional conflict occurs when conflict gets to the point where creativity is stifled and, in fact, almost all work becomes difficult or impossible because of the conflict's intensity. The second big issue is group cohesiveness. Cohesiveness is an intent and desire for group members to stick together in their actions. In organizations, we've learned that in order for work groups to become as good as they can possibly be, the group has to become cohesive. A third significant issue in diversity is resistance to change. If organizations are used to being less diverse, then diversity can become something that's scary to people in organizations. These items are of some of the most significant, but if you're interested, you can always find out more by reading about the topic in organizational management, psychology, or sociology literature. Diversity affects bottom line profits, but to do so, some of the challenges associated with diversity, like conflict and reduced cohesiveness, must be addressed. Creating a cohesive, operational, and highly successful diverse workforce doesn't just happen. Successfully managing diversity requires top management to support and commit to diversity and inclusion efforts. Diversity leadership refers to having top-level managers who are responsible for managing diversity. Finally, and most importantly, employees must be provided with training so that they can work together as teams despite differences in race, gender, age, ability, and other factors. Through managing diversity effectively, affirmative action and diversity programs have been used to help women and minorities advance in organizations. Sexual harassment is defined by the EEOC as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature which constitutes sexual harassment when submission to or rejection of this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with the individual's work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. There are two types of sexual harassment, quid pro quo harassment and hostile work environment. Literally, quid pro quo means this for that. Quid pro quo harassment is harassment that occurs when some type of benefit or punishment is made contingent upon the employee submitting to sexual advances. If you do something for me, I'll do something for you. Or conversely, if you refuse to do something for me, I'll harm you. Quid pro quo is a direct form of harassment aimed at an individual and is most commonly seen in supervisor-subordinate relationships, although this is not always the case. Hostile work environment is a very special legal term in human resource management, meaning harassment that occurs when someone's behavior at work creates an environment that is sexual in nature and makes it difficult for someone to work. 
Hostile work environment sexual harassment happens when a reasonable person determines that the behavior in question goes beyond normal human interaction. For the purposes of the law, a reasonable person is the average person who would look at the situation and its intensity to determine whether the accused person was wrong in their actions. As in other forms of illegal discrimination, the plaintiff has to only show a prima facie, literally on the face of it, meaning it looks like harassment to a reasonable person, case that the harassment has occurred. To qualify as a prima facie case of sexual harassment, the work situation must include the following characteristics. The plaintiff is a member of a protected class. The harassment was based on sex. The person was subject to unwelcome sexual advance or the harassment was significantly severe enough to alter the terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. In order for the organization to be considered for liability, two critical conditions must exist. The plaintiff did not solicit or incite the advances, and the harassment was undesirable and severe enough to alter the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Some cases are clearly sexual harassment on the first offense, such as requesting sex as a part of the job or any unwanted sexual touching. However, some offenses are not so obvious, such as touching on the arm or shoulder or asking the person on a date. In these gray areas, affected employees should tell the harasser that they find the behavior offensive and will report the person for sexual harassment if the behavior is repeated. Once the plaintiff has shown a prima facie case for the accusation, and once it's been determined that the harassment was potentially severe enough to alter the terms, conditions, and privileges of work, and assuming that the organization can't show that the plaintiff invited or incited the advances, as in the case of quid pro quo harassment, then the courts will determine whether the organization is liable for the actions of its employee based on the answers to two primary questions. Did the employer know about or should the employer have known about the harassment and did the employer act to stop the behavior? In general, if the employer knew or should have known about the harassment and did nothing to stop the behavior, then the employer can be held liable. So, how do you protect your organization from liability in the case of sexual harassment, either quid pro quo or hostile work environment? In general, management in the organization should probably institute and communicate a zero-tolerance policy for sexual harassment. It should be a one-strike-and-you're-out offense, a major disciplinary infraction for which a person should be terminated. Why should we have a zero-tolerance policy for this type of behavior? Well, consider if you had an employee who was guilty in the past of harassing another employee. You did the investigation, found that harassment did occur, and disciplined, but did not terminate the harasser. What if, months or even years later, the same employee acted in the same manner towards another individual in your organization? You might be put in the position where you would have to go to court and defend your earlier actions. Religion-based discrimination and the ability of employers to create work rules that may affect religious freedom continue to be an issue in the workplace. For instance, the issue of standards of dress in a number of religions, notably Islam standards for women attire in public, including the hijab, has become a point of contention in some workplaces. There are many religious freedom questions that we're dealing with in companies today, and there are certainly no easy answers. Remember, the federal courts have determined that religious discrimination is a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act because it identifies religion as a protected class. Because religion was specifically identified in the Civil Rights Act, we can't use it as a factor in making any employment decision with our employees. Religion is a less obvious characteristic than gender or race, so it's usually not a characteristic on which we base decisions. However, if a person's religion requires a certain type of dress or observation of religious holidays or days of worship that is not in keeping with normal workday practices of the organization, and if the individual requests accommodation for these religious beliefs, then we generally would need to make a reasonable effort to accommodate such requests. 
Employers are required to provide such a reasonable accommodation for requests that are based on employees' sincerely held religious beliefs or practices, unless doing so would impose an undue hardship on their business operations. The general result of a series of federal court rulings on religion and religious practices has been that if such practices can be accommodated by the organization without creating an excessive burden on the organization, then they must be accommodated under penalty of law. However, if the job description and specifications require employees to work specific days and hours of the day, or complete certain tasks that might violate some personal religious beliefs, and if the applicant accepts the job, then the employer does not need to accommodate any employee requests not to work during those days or hours.